This show is brought to you by South Cal Real Estate Connections. Welcome to the Telescope View with the author of the Final Revelation, the Sun Project, Rick Tellis, and of course, my favorite Martian, Steve Parker, and yours truly, Larry Mangello. In tonight's show, we had, we had a request from a viewer, wanted to know, Rick, about the com communications between the ETs and, and what's going on with our our government. Is there anything really going on with this thing? Does does communication actually occur? Is can it, they phone home? Can they phone home? <laughs> yeah, this is going to get a little weird tonight. Mm -hmm. Like it never gets weird. I was weird. about to say, yeah, that's different. <laughs> it's going to get a little strange, but we're going to talk a little bit about extraterrestrials and the bat phone. Mm -hmm. okay. The bat phone. The bat phone. Oh, boy. Now, this is something that I can say I actually, not the bat phone itself, but some part of this I actually experienced myself uh, without these other people. Uh, when I was working on some cybersecurity authentication and intrusion detection systems, I ran into a thing called ntcep 7 x hmm? What, hmm? what, what was that? What does that stand for? Well, that stands for the Non-Terrestrial Communications Encryption Protocol. Oh, sure. 7X, X being whatever the version it was. And of course, when I heard that and I talked to other guys, we first figured that this has something to do with communicating with satellites, non-terrestrial. Right. Well, when we started talking about people, talking to other people, they said, no, that's not what that is. And we said, well, what are you talking about? And they said, they said you won't believe us, but we'll tell you anyway that apparently since the late 40s, 47, 48, there has been limited communication with an intelligent extraterrestrial life. You're kidding. And this is, what, this is what they told us. And they said that uh, initially, uh, the communication was achieved using old teletypes. But the problem was we didn't have the technology to communicate, okay? So it was very primitive. But what they said is that they received from these extraterrestrials a thing that originally was a black box, kind of like we see floating here. Wow. It was nine by six by three, and it was solid, had no seams, and no wires. And it came from the supposedly. It came the supposedly from an advanced race, and okay. it supposedly communicated with the teletypes, so an ancient form of uh, yeah. email. Yeah. And they didn't know it appeared solid, had no seams, no wires. It was not magnetic, but it attached directly to the teletype. Um, how it interfaced, nobody was really sure. They still weren't sure. And they said in the 1960s, as this went on, that they eventually they eventually started calling it the Bat Phone, no doubt because of the Batman TV show. This, this, and they the had black the box they called it the Bat Phone. And they called it the Bat Phone because what? you know when you're you doing know, this stuff, you call things all kinds of. But stuff. you know what it reminds me of? What's the thing that some people have in their house right now? What is it? Oh, it's like Alexa, or, yeah, or, right. or it's like uh, you know some of these. Yeah, I mean, kind of an odd thing. Well, the problem was apparently what we understand today, mm -hmm. which we didn't understand back in the 40s or even necessarily in the 80s, mm -hmm. is that the transmissions were basically some type of light energy-based transmission. We now know that we can now transmit data ver via light. We yeah. can use fiber optics mm -hmm. and whatever. Mm -hmm. And we also have deep space communications that they want to use lasers for, okay? We didn't know that before. Now it's all a possibility, and this is what they believe was the communication method that this advanced race used, and that there had been, and there continues to be, limited communications with this race. Now, what they said to me is, we call this an arm's length relationship. Okay, it's not like, hey, uh, we want to talk to the man in charge today, mm -hmm. take me to your leader. That doesn't happen. Now, okay. Now I'm. Com I got to ask a question. When they communicate, do they know how far away these things are? We don't. We do not know how far away these things are. Now they could be communicating from anywhere. It could be as close as the moon. Yeah. It could be somewhere else. Now I had. I was told by somebody that at one point a question was asked, "Where are you from?" And the only answer was, "We share a galaxy." Oh. Now that's kind of interesting because most recently probably within the last year, um, was it the Royal Academy of Science in, in, in London or was it somewhere else? But they're saying 
that they now, maybe it was SETI, that they now say they believe that if intelligent life exists within this solar, uh, within this, 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 our galaxy, which is 100 million light years wide, that it's a certain area of it. So again, within our galaxy. Wow. Uh, that was interesting uh, that they would, they, would, they would talk about that. And wouldn't it be interesting if even that thing that's supposedly communicating with us, there's something else that watches over that that they don't know about? I mean, because you talk about the size of the galaxy and how many size galaxies. Size of the galaxy, the size of the universe. Right. There's, according to Kepler and Hubble, there's probably 100 million galaxies. That's a lot of zeros. <laughs> okay. Not kidding. And, and with an average of 40 billion planets in each galaxy that could harbor life like ourselves. Those are big odds. Those are big numbers. So we're looking at things um, pretty possible in today's, what we're learning about today's science. So we have what we call the bat phone, this bat box, solid. Don't know, didn't know how it works, still aren't sure how it works. All we know is, according to the people we talk to, and, and from what I understand now, there's a new NT SEP. It's probably 7X something. Um, but it uses a special digital encrypted format, this NTEP, N, NT SEP thing. And if you're not familiar with encryption, you've yeah, heard about it. What is encryption? What well, does exactly it mean? We use that in the computers. It's a way of coding data so it can't okay. be read by just about anybody. Okay. But NTCEP, I can tell you this without going too far, actually goes beyond simple. And encryption is not simple. I mean, you can have huge encryption keys. It goes beyond that. It actually goes to ciphers. And ciphers are a little different. And when you use a cipher, it's an advanced, I'm going to call it, a, a, and people could explain this differently, but I'm just going to tell you that when you're using ciphers, it gets beyond simple encryption, whereas I can take 12 letters and in 12 letters probably write a paragraph. Wow. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what the, the, the ciphers can do. So I think it's a little bit beyond that. But where, excuse me, where is this black box we keep talking about? Who the, has it? Where is it? We've talked about Flight 9 before. Oh, yeah. Flight 9 is responsible oh, or they have yeah. access to the black box. Flight 9 supposedly is a, 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 a unit, or uh, uh, we talked about this. If you're familiar with the, U, the Air Force and the way they break down mm -hmm. their ranks, you have airmen, you have flights, you have squadrons, you have wings. Well, a flight, sometimes a flight can be much bigger than that, but a flight can be as little as 10 people. It can be as many as, okay. you know. Uh, so they just call it a flight. It's a group. It's a it's a Yeah, a, but we're talking about at a level that's... Uh... At a level so secret that we're not even <laughs> sure where they are and who they directly report to. It's going to be, again, a, a multi-agency joint intelligence committee. And this is called Flight 9. It's called Flight 9. There's supposedly only nine people at any point in time serving in Flight 9. And they're the only ones who know. And then they try and compartment the information even with them. Uh, but, but they're the only ones. And again, it all sounds too fantastic yeah. to be true. Mm -hmm. Would have sounded more fantastic in 1980 or 1990. In 2018, not so, not so fantastic. Now let tell me, tell me when did this start? When did this communication start? The late 40s. So we're going we're gonna to say that it started with, with something probably to do with Roswell. Oh. Certainly after Roswell. Um, the question that I get a lot of times is, Wow, you know, here you got these people, they come a billion light years away and they can fly, and the best they can do is communicate with us with a teletype or <laughs> through text. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Because we can. I'm sorry, do you text every day and do you yeah. use email? It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're doing it the same way. We think this is because of their policy uh, to avoid direct contact as much as possible. All right, they do not want to have direct uh, contact. Um, they do not want to tell us the secrets of the universe. What's the reason for that? We'll talk about that in another show because that's got to be one. That's got to be towards the end of the show is because oh, yeah. you know, people are going to freak out on me when we talk <laughs> about that. The thing is, this hasn't changed in all those years, apparently. I mean, but I mean, we learn more about it. Technically, did we x-ray this thing? or did, I mean, well, what's inside it? Okay, I didn't ask the question of how they figured out what was inside it. All right, so I probably little should green have, guys I like that. <laughs> there's a bunch of people in there, you know, like you see in Men in Black. You know, the yeah, there you go, there you go, yeah. Uh, apparently now they know what's inside. They said it has a crystal core. It's solid with a crystal core, and apparently that crystal core vibrates at some point when they're communicating. How much it vibrates, I don't know that answer to that. So now when I think of that, people say that's impossible. Well, wait a minute. How does your watch work? Do you have a quartz watch on right mm -hmm. now? Is it vibrating? We know there are places yeah. in the Earth where the Earth is so heavily 
uh, uh, there's so much quartz in it that it actually vibrates and different things can happen. You can actually have hallucinations there. So we know that the quartz vibration uh, is possible. We know such a thing as nuclear diamond batteries where data is stored in, mm -hmm. in diamond, uh, actually in a, a diamond and it uses a nuclear battery to, to, as a crystal, uh, in the crystal to, to yeah. store data. We, no, we have no. all that. If memory serves me correct, Rick, when they did, had this event at Roswell, they found crystal spheres. They found, uh, yes, they found um, basically uh, three crystal spheres that were roughly six inches in diameter. I have, I have actually props, yeah. models yeah. of those. Yeah. Uh, and at first, they weren't sure what the purpose of these crystal spheres were, although they did suspect at some point that they might be some type of data repository. And this was at Roswell? At Roswell. Okay, now without sounding like too much of an idiot here, the difference between Area 51 yes. and Roswell. They, are these areas that are close to each other? You know, which one had the supposed Air, crash? I get okay. all that. Area well, 51. Well, there was two events, actually. Oh, really? Two well, events. Well, within Roswell, there were two events. Uh, Area 51 is in the Nellis Range, the Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. Okay. Okay, and that's actually known for, that's where we do all our testing and evaluation of new aircraft. The SR-71 was tested there, the U-2 okay. was tested there, anything new is tested there. We also do radar testing there. And, you know, in UFO lore, supposedly some of the crash debris went from Roswell. Oh, okay. Actually went to Texas, and then it went to Area 51. Roswell was, uh, is, is a city in New Mexico where the ranch, where the Brazel, uh, Bra uh, Mac Brazel was on the ranch where the, the UFO supposedly crashed right. in 1947 or did crash in 1947. Uh, so those are the two different uh, so, Okay, areas. so it's, it's basically the stuff from 50, uh, Area 51 is connected to Roswell through this stuff supposedly people would going say, okay. People would say that. The reality is with uh, Area 51 is probably not anything ever went to Area 51. Might have gone through Area 51, but actually went to an area known as S2, which is south of F Area 51. All Area 51 means is you have a big map of Nevada and the Nellis Air Force Base, and they have sections. One, two, three, four. Remember, they did nuclear testing there. So maybe nuclear testing went on Area 24. Okay. All it okay. is is Section 24. Okay. Section 51. Okay. That's, that's what I that just is. always get confused on this. Yeah, so I'm no. sorry, go ahead. So that, that, that's all that that really is. Um, so when we talk about that, uh, the, the, the communication supposedly started late 47, maybe early 48, and it, it, it went on since there because something did happen. The communication was strictly with this box. It was solely with this box and through this box. Was there ever, <clears throat> ever any kind of a face to face kind of a thing? Face. Now, I was informed that face-to-face -face meetings did and do occur. They did. They did and, and do, do occur, but they are extremely, extremely, extremely rare. Wow. Okay, extremely rare. I can't imagine there must be some, some epic reason why this would have to happen. Because, you know, in Hollywood... You know, you're going to see the movies where, you know, every day we, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They, they show up and they come in. Hey, you want to go to Starbucks? You know, that's why it's called Starbucks, yeah. you know, okay. right? Because that's where they prefer to go. No, it's not like that at all. And we're again, we're not talking about a race of squids somewhere in the world. We're talking about people like us that are doing what we do on Mars and Jupiter. and whatever. They're exploring the universe but they're just 100, 200, 300 years advanced, but they're like us, okay? So don't think that this is so wild and weird, no. Someday, I mean, if you look at what happened in the Pacific in World War II, mm -hmm. when we showed up with airplanes on some of these islands, the islanders, yeah. they couldn't Magic, imagine yeah. what yep. we were. We, were in, we flew with birds and whatever. We're gonna do the same thing someday on another planet. We're gonna land somewhere, we're gonna go somewhere, we're gonna be the aliens, and we're gonna mm -hmm. perhaps encounter maybe another race, and we're gonna look just like we look possibly today. And again, like I've said before, <clears throat> everything is impossible until it isn't, okay? And our reality is defined mostly by our science. What our science can't define, what our science can't prove, must be religion, superstition, yeah, yeah. conspiracy theory, or in today's world, fake news. But my point so many times is that our, our science, we are now learning that our science in terms of exoscience or anything off of this planet or in space is incredibly anemic. 
every day Jet Propulsion Lab and NASA come back and say, we just learned something, we were totally wrong. I love it when they say that. We were wrong. <laughs> we were wrong in the way this worked. We were wrong what was between the rings of Saturn and the planet Saturn, because they learned a couple of weeks ago. What they found between the, between the, the last between ring the and Saturn was complex organic materials. Oh. That's life. <laughs> life. Yep. They found methane, they found carbon monoxide, carbon, di carbon di um, dioxide. Um, these are all parts of life. And we assume that all life is carbon-based and must have these. They found water, they found uh, H2O. We believe that's necessary for life. So if on our science that's what we believe, well, there it is in car complex organic materials. And Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn, they found the same thing, complex organic materials. On one of the moons of Jupiter, they found complex organic materials. What we are learning is that life, whether it be single cell mm -hmm. or a few particles, is probably rampant within our solar system when in the past we were taught not Nothing, possible. Yeah. And, and NASA says we were wrong. So what else are we wrong about? We're wrong about physics to a certain extent, with the, with the, now with the discovery of gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. We believe they couldn't mm -hmm. exist, only fields. Mm -hmm. So the point is that if you're out there and you're saying this is impossible, my question to you is, based on what do you mm -hmm. say that? Because you can no longer hold up to me based on our science, because I'm gonna ask you, our science was wrong about this, physics, our science was wrong about this. So how can we know for sure? Now, we can argue it can, it's, as, it's, as, it's, as not, it's as much not possible as possible. Yeah, I can agree with that. But we can no longer say not possible. Well, yeah, they used to say microorganism organ, organism, organism really didn't exist. Be careful where you go there, Larry. Oh, yeah. You get okay. in all kinds of yes. trouble. We'll be up here. <laughs> Semmelweis in, I'm going to say the 17th century, you can check me on this. He first threw out the theory that the reason we get sick was because of these things he called microorganisms in the body. And he was just like, just like Copernicus and Galileo. No, it can't be. The body is two pieces, it's soul and it's physical. And when, that, and when we get sick, it's because the physical part broke down. And Semmelweis came out and said, no, there's such a thing as microorganisms. Well, do we know if they exist today? Sure they do. There's all kinds of microorganisms and that's what we're made up of. And, and, that was impossible until it wasn't. So when you start to argue with me, you're going to have to be able to defend our science. And I don't know anyone who can at any level. Like I said, I've spoken to physics professors from, from, from UConn and, and college, and they'll say, we don't know if we agree with you, but we have to agree that we can't any longer dismiss it based on our science alone. Well, well you know, and then, I'm sorry. Then we had talked about the possibility of time travel, because that could be too, in which case somebody that was us could be way out there. Well, well and, and Einstein said, now I'm going to say something, and it's the way my son presented it to me last week, and I had never thought of it this way, but he's absolutely right. Time is only a human concept. It doesn't exist in the universe. Nowhere in the universe is the concept of time. Do you know where the concept of time really came from? Was Newton. Yeah. Newton pretty much solidified the concept of time as a, as a, a reference for us to manage and organize mm -hmm. things, including space. Time, I don't know how you wrap your head around this, doesn't exist in space. So when we say the universe is 27 billion years old, it doesn't matter because time doesn't exist. And time doesn't exist for things like light. Light travels at the speed of time, time, which means it doesn't exist. Now you notice in a lot of these, like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind or in the show you've been watching, people might go away and come back and no time has passed because time is irrelevant supposedly to these people that we're oh. speaking to, this mm -hmm. race. Time is irrelevant, it's a human concept. Wrap your head around that, I can't. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I can understand it's a human concept. It's just something that we use to manage day in and day out and, and whatever. And we know how fast time can go. But then the other concept is time doesn't move. We move through time, okay? The universe moves through time. Yep. We don't. Okay, so what we're talking about here gets wow. very convoluted. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're, 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 we're getting into concepts that 
to me, further solidify why we can't understand the existence of this race. I like when you keep saying everything is possible until it isn't. Everything yeah. is possible until it isn't. Yeah. Isn't That's that true? It. Oh, yeah. Television, mm -hmm. not now, possible. Now, Rick, with this communication going on, I mean, who 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 is handling this thing? Again, this is flight nine. I was going to say this flight is flight nine, nine <laughs> and we go again to. Do the politicians know about this? To let, no, they are not privy to this. This is top secret, uh, you know, uh, um, secret compartmented information at the highest levels. You don't want many people to know this, and even the flight nine people would tell you we don't know all the pieces. They want to keep people want to keep this up, but somebody must know it all. Who is that person? Somebody always knows something, but we so don't know who that is. There, there's people then that just work on parts of this. Nobody has the whole scheme of things going on. Right. Right? We were given, I can tell you this much, when we were doing data authentication, intrusion detection, um, uh, uh, and we were doing forensics on data communication, Part of our job was to make sure that whatever communication is coming through is, is authentic, mm -hmm. all right? Because we don't want you know, somebody to be on a battlefield or somebody to be flying a plane and get some data that's not right and then act on that data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we would see different types of communications and different protocols and different things. And I'm not going to go into what the different things were, but you know, uh, there is a, I know this is, this is kind of going to be hard to believe, but not hard to believe for the government. I worked for this group, and there was me and this other guy. His name was Bruce. And for some reason, they thought Bruce and I looked alike. And I don't think we looked alike at all. But Bruce did one thing, and I did something else. And, and, and that's, what, that's what you did. One day, a file was placed on my desk, because you would request files. And they would come. And you know, if they were secret, they were marked secret. They would be placed on your desk in a certain place, and then they're secure. And I'm looking at this file, and I open it up. And I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, this is not my stuff. This is Bruce's. Mm -hmm. right, this was supposed to go to Bruce. Somebody must have said, bring this to Bruce, and they thought I was Bruce, and they put it on. How could that happen? Government operation, it can happen. And I'm looking at something, I see something in this file, and I'm going, I've never seen anything like that. I've, I've never seen anything, what is that? All right, now maybe I should have closed the file. Mm -hmm. and yeah. put it away. So I went to somebody else, and I said, I want to show you this. And they opened it up, they go, how did you get this? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, I got it by accident. They go, yeah, huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> I said, what is this? And they look at that, and they say, We've never seen anything like that. I said, well, you're supposed to be the experts in, in what that is. And it was, a, it was a formula. And they said, uh, that doesn't exist. I said, well, what is it? They said, put it back in the file. Give it to Bruce. Give it to Bruce. <laughs> oh, boy. I said, all right, we're going to put it back in the file. And we gave it to Bruce because we didn't want uh, to get uh, anybody else. Is Bruce um, still with us? As far as I know, he is. Okay. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce is still with us. He wasn't taken away. Um, but it was that same thing. So. I can understand all that. There's, and I, I'm not going to say I know all about this world. I'm not going to say that. But I'm just going to say but based on what I do know and what I understand from other people, there is a world out there, a shadowy world. I'm not saying shadowy bad, but a shadowy world out there where people have to do work and have to do things that you can't even possibly imagine. Okay, You, you, you would watch TV, and you might see this thing suggested on TV. but. It, it's, it, it's bigger than what you would possibly imagine. I mean, the cyber world alone is bigger than what most people would imagine. It's probably our, the biggest threat that we have against us today. Mm -hmm. wow, wow. It's bigger than you imagine. So these things do exist and they are, are out there. And then some people say, well, that concerns me. And I've had people say, it, or, or, or read the book, and they read something in the book, yeah. uh, The Final Revelation. So probably, I had one lady uh, who we had spoken to. There was a couple of weeks ago, I gave a presentation on UFOs mm -hmm. and, and the status and what is the reality of UFOs. Um, and Larry was with me. And, and, and we will do that. If anybody is interested in a presentation like this and they'd like oh, to talk absolutely. about it, we, we will do it. She was, she, she had some questions. And she said to me at the end, she goes, can I send you some questions, a couple of questions? I said, yeah, sure. Sends me 25 questions. <laughs> but I can tell from the questions that some of the ones that she sent me, she was concerned and something frightened her about this. I can tell you that the people I worked with, and especially some of the younger people, because I was an older person at the time, these are some of the very best we have. And they are, the, they, they, they are uh, you can trust them. They play by the rules, not what you hear on TV, mm -hmm. not what you hear in the news, none of this. They play by the rules. They're very serious about how they, they take care of the information and that they have a responsibility to protect every one of us. They take it very seriously. They're very good at what they do. Wait a minute. Is this thing vibrating? It might be. <laughs>
It's not the real box. Okay. okay. Anybody watch? <laughs> I do not have the real box. I'll have somebody at my doorstep. Yeah. Well, looking for this. You brought up a good point, Rick. If anybody wants to have a presentation, where we would love to talk to you. And believe me, our last episode... We'll do it for a charity event. If somebody wants yeah. to raise money and we can yeah. help, we'll do it. I'm working on that right now with two different cases. Okay. And I hope to get it, get it together. And in the future, we are gonna, planning to have an audience here that we're going to be conversing back and forth with. And as usual, time has flown, and we are going to be saying goodbye. And I want to thank everybody for viewing tonight, and please email us at theviewshow at aol.com. Thank you.